Well, hello, all my little hops children. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Hops Virtual Workshop number 14, continuing our series of SMS workshops, and this week on the subject of competence management. So we'll give everyone a good few minutes to join in. We'll start shortly after seven o'clock. Please let me know via the comments whether the sound is okay and that you can see the picture and all that stuff. Hello, let me do some hellos here. So first of all, first in the hops workshop tonight is Andy Green from the Cambrian Heritage Railway. Hello Andy, thank you very much for joining and being viewer number one. James Francis Beck is watching from Norfolk. Hello, hello Phil McIver from Telford and PNP Events I think. And Liz, hello, thank you very much, Liz, for tuning in from the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Giles Gilbert from South Devon, hello. Hello, Alexander, who said hello to himself in the comments. Alex is doing the auto queue for me this evening, so thank you very much, Alex, for that. Hello, David Knott, who, oh, you're testing my memory now, David. Old Kiln Light Railway, is it? Please correct me in the comments if that's wrong. Hello to Stuart Mulliner. John Garvey is watching. What railway are you from, John? Uh, mm, mm, mm. Thank you, Andy, for letting me know that you can see the picture. That's marvellous. Hello, Mark Wilson from the Gloucestershire Warwickshire Railway. Alistair Baker from Bressingham, the location with more gauges than anyone else. Colin Fisher from the North Dorset Railway. Hello to you. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll give everyone a good few minutes to join before we start. see how we get on. Adrian Coveney is watching from China. Hello Adrian, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope this is going to be useful. Amazingly we've actually managed to start on time this week, not like the normal Hobbs performance of starting at 10 past the official time. Some time while everyone's joining in, I'll just bring up the live workshops program just so that you can see what else is coming up over the next few weeks. Every six weeks we have these Hops Live workshops, 7 p.m. on a Tuesday, once every six weeks. Today is the third of our program of seven for this year. Although I have had a few requests for some extra topics, so we might slot some extra ones in. I can talk to you a little bit about that later, but I'll be very glad if you want to let me know if there are other topics you want to hear about, and we will slot them in. <laughs> Hello, Jens Fallonson. What railway are you from, Jens? I don't think that's a name that I've heard before. Thank you very much for tuning in. Another very good turnout. That is correct. Right, I'll give it another 10 seconds and then we will make a start. I've got some new broadcasting software, which does seem to work better than the old stuff I used to use. Uh, but do let me know if I get it wrong. I have to manually change you over between views on this one. It doesn't change over automatically like the old one did. So if I carry on talking and what I'm talking about isn't on the screen, then feel free to mention it in the comments and I'll pick that up and uh, change the screen that you can see. Right, I think we'll make a start now, two minutes past seven. Just get myself sorted out. Right, okay, so hello everyone, thank you very much for tuning in. This is Hops Virtual Workshop number 14, continuing our series of SMS workshops, safety management system workshops. And this week we're concentrating on competence management. Now competence management is an absolutely enormous subject, so I'm going to try and cram in as much as I possibly can, but I shall say now that I don't think I'm going to finish everything I can think of to say about uh, competence management. I'm going to go until about half past eight, otherwise we'll still be here uh, until midnight, but half past eight is normally the time at which everyone starts to fall asleep uh, when I'm talking. Uh, so we'll see how far we get and uh, we can always have another one another day or a little follow-up and I'm sure there'll be lots of feedback from this one. Oh, on the subject of feedback, don't forget that the workshop isn't just a one-night thing. The workshop goes on and on and on forever. 
and after the last workshop I got loads of extra comments so that was absolutely brilliant thank you so much for everybody that fed back both during and after the workshop and said we've had this idea or have you thought about that or this is what we do at our railway that's all really useful it all feeds into a, a best practice template this workshop I think everyone was uh, was, was was keen and waiting for because I've almost received feedback before the workshops even taken place I'm really glad that um, some railways have sent in their existing documentation for me to pour through and pull out what I think is the best practice out of all of them, uh, which is what you're going to see uh, this evening. Uh, but if you see something this evening that you don't like the sound of, uh, or you think you can do better, or you've just got a comment to make, then please, please do comment it in the comments. This is not just about me telling you what to do, and I certainly don't claim to know everything there is to know about what we should be doing. This is just what I've found over the years from being involved in Heritage Railways, um, in various capacities that hopefully will be useful for you um, to pick out the bits you want for your own organisation. I'll just catch up on some hellos. Hello to Adam Williams from the Dean Forest Railway. Hello Adam, thank you very much for tuning in. Mark Hayton from the Allen Valley Railway. Thank you very much Mark. Alan Napier Ely from the Bowness and Keneal Railway. Ah, oh, hello Alan, I hope you're well. And Francis from the Epping Ongar Railway. Thank you very much for tuning in. Right, uh, as with uh, my other SMS uh, workshops, we'll have some slides first and I'll explain a bit about what we're going to do and then we'll go to the Word document templates and we'll talk through how they have uh, come about. Uh, the documents will be published afterwards for Advanced Hops members. I'm very sorry that it's only for Advanced Hops members, but we do have to pay the bills somehow. Everyone's welcome to join into the workshops, but the templates and documents are only available in the Advanced section of Hops afterwards. So let's make a start. Um, as I've already said, please do join in. This is about sharing. This is not about me telling you what to do. This is about us all learning from each other. So please do in the comments, challenge what you hear and put your own point of view in. The video will be on YouTube afterwards. So if you can't watch it live now on Facebook, which I guess I'm speaking to people that aren't here, it will be on YouTube afterwards. The aim of this series of workshops is to construct a best practice set of SMS templates. It is not to construct one SMS that will fit absolutely every railway because that would be impossible. It's to construct a set of templates that you will need to pull apart and tweak and adjust to meet the risks and the processes that are applicable in your particular organisation. But hopefully by having this best practice set of templates will save a lot of time, will save us all on every railway having to start this process from scratch every time. In doing so we'll save a bit of cost and it will put us all in a position where we can demonstrate that we're following the best practice of our peer organisations. As I've said, this is not about me saying what you must do. I'm just going to present you with one set of ideas that I've come up with that I hope will be useful for you. There are many, many ways to skin a cat and you may have a completely different way. That's absolutely fine. There are some things that I'm going to talk about in this workshop. In actual fact, there are things that you must do because I've copied them out of rocks. But I'll try and make clear where I'm saying these are things that we must do and these are things that I'm just suggesting this is a, this is a possibility. Just also to be clear, I'm not saying that this is guaranteed to be suitable for every single undertaking. It's your responsibility to make sure that the SMS that you implement uh, is suitable for your uh, railway. Uh, a very brief recap. I know I did this at the very beginning of the previous two workshops, but just for anybody that didn't join in on the previous ones, this is the structure of company that we're going to be working to in the SMS. It has frontline staff at the bottom, the drivers, the P-Way staff, the signalmen, the platform dispatchers, all those people. Each one is um, supposed to be managed by head of department as far as this ideal hops utopia of an SMS goes. So there'll be a head of signalling, a head of guards, a head of workshop ahead of all that sort of stuff. The next level up is called the manager of the business unit. So every department manager reports to a manager of the business unit and the manager of the business unit is an appointed role. It's the person who is always that role, whether they're on duty or not. So it's like the operations manager, the commercial manager, the engineering manager, that sort of thing. And above them is expected to be some sort of general manager or managing director or one point that it all pyramids to at the top. I talked about that at great length in workshop number one, so uh, if that brief overview is not uh, sufficiently detailed for you, then I strongly suggest that you have a, a watch of the first part of workshop number one, uh, where it was talked about in a lot more detail. On a day-to-day -day basis, this is again how uh, I've designed my SMS templates uh, to be deployed. Frontline staff at the bottom, 
with a, some sort of duty officer or duty manager or duty something role, or perhaps more than one of those people with the departments grouped by the functions that they're performing. And that's called a function supervisor. And that's designed to be a role that is a shift role. So not one duty officer for the whole railway all the time, but you could have one person in on Monday and a different person in on Tuesday. They're fulfilling the roles of duty officer, but it's a shift role rather than a permanent role like a manager of the business unit. And they report on a day to day basis up to some sort of on call manager higher up the hierarchy. Again, talked about in much more detail in um, workshop number one. Uh, I've been asked quite a lot over the last few weeks about this numbering structure that I've been using. I did explain it briefly in the in the first uh, SMS workshop. The numbering structure that we're applying to these SMS documents is, I've used the word hops, but the first part of it will be the initials of your organisation. This is only what I recommend. I'm not saying you must do this, but this is going to fit in with the templates that we're creating. Then a slash and then SMS for all the SMS documents. You could have other words there for your other types of documents like com for commercial or I don't know, I can't think of other things, but your initials slash SMS. And then the top three on this page First of all, SMS 1. So a very small number of documents at the top that are overall overarching SMS documents. And SMS 1 is what I would call the SMS overall document, the pointer document that points to all these other policies um, that exist. On the second line, SMS slash A slash 1, this letter here in red represents an area of the railway. And I've described out there what the letters are that in my templates that I've got in my notes from over the years of what I've used in the past because you've asked me look can you tell us what these letters are in advance so that we know where we can we can slot things in and where we can work around letters um, as they've been created um, so generally they're pretty self-explanatory sometimes we've run out of letters and we just had to pick a letter of the alphabet so just to confirm A for S and T and that was one that we just had to pick out the alphabet because we'd already used S for signaling operations and T for track safety C for competence, D for diesel, and that is expected to be diesel, loco, footplate, and diesel maintenance engineering. Um, e for special event, G for guard, J for job descriptions, K for risk, L for steam loco, again footplate and engineering, M for duty officers, N for stations, O for workshops and machinery, P for permanent way, R for rules, S for signalling operations, as distinct from signal engineering, S and T, which is A, T for track safety, W for carriage and wagon. Y was deliberately left out the alphabet of this uh, of this scheme so that um, if there were things specific to local organisations, you can slot them into Y. So if you have something um, extremely um, unusual that a lot of other railways don't have, oh, well, I've got an example, like if you've got a, a public house. So some railways do have railway pubs like the Seven Valley and the East Lanks. Because we don't have a letter for that, Y would be the letter that I would suggest. If you want to follow this numbering system, you put them in. There's nothing to say you have to follow this numbering system at all. This is just how I build the templates. And Z for everything else. So you can see the structure goes hop slash SMS slash one of these letters of the alphabet. And then it's just one, two, three, four, five, or however you want to number the documents after that. I recommend that you don't reuse numbers. If you get rid of a policy altogether and say we don't need a policy on that anymore, I would leave that number blank and then carry on from whatever number you got to. The only time where I've deviated from this is the third line that you can see where it says hop slash SMS slash C slash A slash 2. The first C, C for competence, and then after I had um, got as far as C for competence, I then broke it down again into slash A, competence for S&T, slash D, competence for diesel, slash G, competence for guards. So it follows the same uh, numbering or lettering uh, sequence. It's just C for competence and then the letter that you're actually talking about the competence of which of course is what we're going to talk about today. And then the index number one, two, three, four, five, just in the order that you happen to uh, write the documents in. So you've all asked, or a lot of you have asked, that's the numbering structure that I've uh, been using for a long time and what I've built these templates to replicate. You don't have to follow it, but if you wanted to know the answers as to which letters were which, those are the letters that I've used. A number of railways just go policy one, policy two, up to policy 765. That's absolutely fine. You don't have you want, it makes very little difference. Uh, so just to give an example, a further example, in fact, but I think I've talked about this as much as I need to really, hop slash SMS slash A slash dot 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 for the S&T. So you can see here, this is completely made up, but I did slash one for the signalling department management, just a policy on that, slash two for the maintenance policy, 
And then because I've got three locations in my imagination, I did slash three for the FPL inspections form. But because I've decided to make a specific one for each location, I did slash three slash one slash three slash two and slash three slash three. I could have gone three, four, five. As I say, it doesn't really matter. Um, but since you asked, I have uh, explained here in detail what my numbering uh, policy is. And one more then, competence, because it's what we're going to be looking at today. This is what I imagine for competence is there'll be an SMS slash C slash one, which is the competence management system for the organization. A very high level document that dictates how things that are done consistently across the whole organization uh, will be done. But then, as before, remember we said slash C slash and then a letter of the alphabet. So I've got slash C slash P slash one for the P way competence management uh, document. I'm imagining, as you will see as we go through, that as well as there being an overall competence management system document for the whole organization, that there will be a department management document for each department as well. So it'll be slash P. And then the numbers just continue two, three, four, five for the um, other documents and competence standards related to, to uh, the assessment of competence in that particular department. So if I looked at ST, I might find slash C slash A slash one for the overall ST competence management, and then slash C slash A slash two, three, four, five, six, seven, however you want to do it uh, for all the other things. Okay, I think I've uh, talked about that enough as needs to be talked about, but that's the numbering system. So let's get on to competence management then, the reason that we're here today. Uh, first of all, we're going to go through some slides related to ROGS and this ORR guidance document, which is really helpful. I've put the links there, you can laboriously type them in if you want, but the ORR document can be found just by typing in ORR, Safety Critical Tasks, um, into Google uh, and you'll find it. It's RSP4, Railway Safety Publication 4, and it's really useful because it, it gives interpretation for some of the uh, vocabulary used in ROGS into a specific um, railway context um, and it has a section in there particularly for uh, mapping of terms in ROGS to a heritage railway which is obviously really useful. It's also got, I've just noticed, a picture there of an HST on the Dawlish seawall which is near where I live. Uh, we'll also be using the, uh, the actual ROGS uh, legislation, the ROGS regulations from the legislation website, which again you can find by typing ROGS 2006 legislation into Google and it will come up with the government legislation website. Um, and that is obviously the, um, the, the ultimate sort of law that we are uh, complying with. All oh, right, loads of other people have tuned in. Uh, so hello to everyone who's tuned in. I'm not going to read off all these names and names, but thank you very much everyone for tuning in. It's all coming up on the you here. So thank you very much indeed. And some alternative suggestions for uh, the letters as they apply to each department. So again, you can do it how you like. Um, it was just an idea, just a suggestion uh, that might work for you. Okay, so let's take a bit of a dive into ROGS then and see what it says, see what we're trying to actually comply with. So part four of ROGS is the part that we're interested in, the part related to the control of safety critical work. And I promise I'm not going to read out the whole thing because it would take forever, but I've picked out the paragraphs that I think are really uh, important. The paragraphs that we really want to comply with in the context of our, uh, our heritage railway undertakings. So first of all, every controller of safety critical work, so far as is reasonably practicable, my favourite saying, uh, shall ensure that a person under his management, supervision or control, dot, 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 only carries out safety critical work where? That person has been assessed as being competent and fit to carry out that work following an assessment by an assessor. And you can see, and this is going to be a theme of this, that I've coloured in some key words, um, and this is exactly coming out of ROGS, uh, that I think are particularly important for us to pay attention to. So, every safety critical worker shall have been assessed as being competent and fit to carry out that work following an assessment by an assessor. We've got to have all three of those things in order for uh, in, in order to be compliant. Um, now, incidentally, ROGS is of course all about safety critical work. Most, oh sorry, uh, a lot of work on heritage railways is safety critical, of course. There's also a lot of work that's not safety critical. But I think um, to a large extent it can be managed in the same way. If it's easier for you, it can be managed following the same processes, the same assessment cycle, uh, all, all that sort of thing. It doesn't have to be safety critical work is the uh, is the important thing that ROX is concerned about. There is an accurate and up-to-date record in writing 
of that person's competence and fitness, which references any criteria for determining competence and fitness against which that assessment of competence was made. It has to be accurate and up to date, and it has to be in writing. It's here in black and white, in ROGS, it has to be in writing. Now, um, I obviously talked to a lot of railways in terms of uh, uh, you know, the deployment and, and the operation of hops, and I know that some railways have really comprehensive, really verbose, fully written out, fully up-to-date, accurate records of assessment of everything that goes on, and that's marvellous. And there are some that say, we do it verbally, or we don't have any evidence, but we know he's competent. And all of that is extremely flaky if it was ever tested, if it was ever called on to be um, examined, let's say following an incident, that it's in somebody's head or it's in any way not written down in such a way that it can be held up and used as tangible evidence. So it must be up to date, it must be accurate and it must be in writing and it must reference the criteria for determining competence and fitness against which that assessment of competence was made. I always find it very helpful when I'm writing out my assessment criteria, which we'll get to as we go through this workshop, that I just print out or I, I format the assessment criteria in such a way that I can print it out and use it as I'm doing the assessment. And then it's not so necessary for me to worry about, oh, does question six match question six in this other document? If it's all in the same place and I'm writing what my observation of the candidate was next to the paragraph that um, details the criteria for determining competence that I used, then I can't get the two confused and mixed up. But as we see as we'll go along, um, I'll show you an example of an assessment criteria uh, that I've made uh, in the past. Uh, there is a, a duty of cooperation, as there is in many things in ROGS. I don't think that's as relevant here when we're talking about competence management, but just to confirm, there is a duty of cooperation that um, competence uh, uh, evidence is shared by to other undertakings involved in that safety critical work. I suspect in most cases, most heritage railways work independently, but certainly for example, heritage railways that also operate on the main line, there's a duty of cooperation there between you and Network Rail or whoever it is um, to, if necessary, share each other's uh, competence information. It's also necessary if you have locomotive owning groups, for example, that work on a heritage railway. Hopefully your agreement will specify under whose auspices the work is being carried out, but certainly there's a, a big duty of cooperation there to work together to, to establish who's responsible for what and that the, the people doing the work are, are competent. Um, and finally, there are in place suitable and sufficient arrangements for monitoring competence and fitness of that person. Monitoring is the key word here. It isn't acceptable, I'm afraid, to pass somebody out and say, very good, you've passed out today, see you in two years for the research. There is a requirement here in ROGS uh, for monitoring, although ROGS does not specify, as you wouldn't expect it to, how frequently or what form that monitoring has to take place, like so many things, and in fact, like the assessment criteria, that's down to us as railways uh, to write and then to live or die by. Right, okay, a uh, couple of definitions then. We mentioned controller of safety critical work in the last uh, slide, and this means any person controlling the carrying out of safety critical work on a transport system or in relation to a vehicle used on a transport system. It's essentially, it's us. It's us in charge of heritage railways. If we're in charge of it, we are a controller of safety critical work. If anything, it's probably easier for us in, in the heritage world to define that we're controllers of safety critical work than in the sort of complex mainline arrangements. Do feel free to shout out in the comments if you uh, have any comments or questions as we go along. Uh, please don't be afraid. Uh, right, safety critical task means, uh, and this uh, I find is particularly useful to refer to that ORR document um, that paraphrases it into specific railway terminology like hand signalman and pilotman and, and locomotive fitter and things like that, specifically in the context of a heritage railway. It, is, it includes driving, dispatching, or any other activity which is capable of controlling or affecting the movement of that vehicle. So a very wide range of roles in the railway that in some way or another can control or affect the movement of a vehicle. Signalling and signalling operations, the operation of level crossing equipment, receiving and relaying of communications, or any other activity which is capable of controlling or affecting the movement of that vehicle. Coupling and uncoupling, installation of components. So you might think at that stage, oh my goodness me, and in fact ROGS defines installation of components to be quite a, a frontline level of responsibility, 
but luckily ROGS gives us the bit in yellow other than where the installation of those components is subject to supervision and checking by a safety critical worker or a controller of safety critical work. And this is a really useful paragraph for Heritage Railways, I find, because it means we can have labourers working in the shed or um, labourers working in P-Way or S&T or any of those sorts of departments. Not absolutely everybody needs to be trained on how to tighten up a nut and bolt as long as once that labourer has finished installing that component or doing whatever it is, it is somebody who does have the competence, uh, is supervising and checking and signing off that safety critical work uh, once it's been completed. Um, so it's quite useful. As with everything, it's down to us to determine the risk of the installation of these particular components and who should be allowed to do it and who shouldn't. Um, but it's very convenient that ROGS does say that as long as it is uh, supervised and checked by a safety critical worker, then we can use all of our volunteers to do uh, the legwork. And the same applies to maintenance. ROGS has a very, very wide definition of maintenance and lots of things that we do count as maintenance. But once again, other than where the carrying out of that maintenance is subject to supervision and checking by a safety critical worker or a controller of safety critical work. Um, incidentally, uh, I don't think I specifically mentioned it, but on one of the previous slides, it certainly mentioned that uh, all those carrying out safety critical work and it gave us the, um, the clause of other than those being trained or directly supervised. So it's a bit of a capture 22 situation. If a trainee can never complete the task in order to be assessed on it, ROGS does uh, specifically allow for that as well. Checking that a vehicle is working properly and by carrying goods that it is correctly loaded before being used. Checking that a vehicle is working properly will include things like exams on uh, carriages and locomotives, either of a periodical nature or before they go out that day. Okay, so quite a lot of definitions. There's just a couple more. Assessor, Rox defines an assessor as any person who is competent to make an impartial and objective assessment of another person's competence or fitness to carry out safety critical work. This is an interesting definition. Assessor means any person who is competent. That means assessors must have to be assessed. There should be some sort of process for assessing the assessors in order to prove that they've got the skills and uh, fitness necessary to assess people's competence and fitness necessary to carry out the tasks that they're doing. I'm not going to get too bogged down in assessing of assessors during this uh, workshop, but it's definitely something to bear in mind that assessor is a competence in its own right, uh, and there should be a process for um, assessing the competence of assessors. Uh, fitness, I included this one because it includes physical and mental uh, fitness, so this is not all about competence. Um, I do know of a railway that I went to once and there was somebody there who had a gleaming uh, PTS certificate and was walking around with two uh, walking sticks. And unfortunately, I suspect that uh, if we were honest when we did the risk assessment on that, we would have found that it wasn't appropriate for that person to have PTS. So fitness includes physical and mental fitness and it is appropriate to consider that particularly for um, uh, roles that require a certain degree of mobility. Uh, particularly mobility to move out of the way in an emergency. Oh, here's the definition of installation, which I referred to accidentally in the previous uh, slide, includes the installation, examination and testing of components, and maintenance includes repair work, which is very broad, reconditioning, examination and testing or alteration. So, as I alluded to, we might go, oh my goodness me, that's, that's everything that we do, but remember, on the previous page, unless it's being supervised and signed off by a safety critical worker. Uh, and finally, operator means any person carrying out, carrying on, uh, means any person carrying on an undertaking which includes a transport system or any part of it for the provision of transport services on such a system. Operator is the user. Right, have we got to the end of definitions? Yes, we have. Thank goodness for that. Right, okay, so moving on with ROGS then. I promise we'll get to the end of uh, this relevant part of ROGS in a minute and we'll move on to the template documents. Uh, this is a, a particularly uh, useful, uh, well not useful, but important definition in ROGS, important in the context of a heritage railway. ROGS part 4, section 23, paragraph 1 says that work includes voluntary work. And I'm afraid to say that I have heard it before, that we're only volunteers being used as an excuse to try and not follow competence management processes. I'm sorry, but it just does not wash uh, at all. It doesn't matter how much somebody gets paid. If they're a worker, they're a worker. And that is the end of that. 
Right, where have we got to? Okay, uh, one last thing, and this is to do with reviewing of uh, competence. Every controller of safety critical work, everyone who runs a steam railway, um, shall, without unreasonable delay, review any person's competence or fitness where they have reason to doubt the competence or fitness of a person carrying out that safety critical work, or there has been a significant change in the matters to which the assessment relates, and where, as a result of any such review, a reassessment of competence or fitness is required. That reassessment of competence or fitness shall be carried out to ensure that the requirements of paragraph one are met, which was that everybody must be um, qualified and in date and the evidence exists in a written form. So this is this is underlining the point I made earlier that it's not acceptable to just pass somebody out and say, there you are, you're good for two years. They have to be monitored and the onus is on us to withdraw that person's competence if it becomes apparent that they're not performing it appropriately. We can't hide behind oh, well, they did their assessment and it was okay, if they are clearly no longer okay. And that's not a criticism on the person who did the original assessment. It's just life, isn't it, that somebody could conceivably pass an assessment, no problem, work fine for six months, and then for any number of external factor reasons, their performance could deteriorate. Where a reassessment of competence or fitness under what we've just read is required, the controller of safety critical work shall ensure that as a result, the health and safety of persons on the transport system is not prejudiced. So you're not allowed to wait around while they continue to uh, perform inadequately um, while you wait to review their competence. Right, and there's a picture which I think we've already seen on the left-hand side of the legislation website, which we can look at as we go through this, and we'll certainly look at if you come up with any questions that I haven't uh, thought of before or included in my template. And over on the right hand side is the safety critical tasks clarification issued by the ORR. Right, just to have a quick brief look at that, let me see if I can move you over to here. Yes, good, the system works. Uh, right, this is the ORR's safety critical tasks clarification of ROGS document. I'm not going to read it all the way through, but I'm just going to show it to you to show you how useful it is. There's a bit of an introduction and then there's all these, where have we got to? Right, here we are. There's all these tables that list a task and which regulation in ROGS it refers to and why the task is safety critical. So all of these, and, and let's not forget that the definition of whether something is safety critical or not depends on the task that's being done, not the job title that the person has or anything like that. It's, is this person dispatching a train or a tram? It doesn't matter whether they're called a dispatcher or a station master or a porter or a guard or anything like that. It's based on the task that they're doing. So this is a really useful document. It goes through every single um, clause in the regulations about um, uh, what is safety critical and what isn't. And right at the end, in Annex B, the Heritage Railways and Tramways clarification of safety critical task, it goes through and it does the same again, specifically aimed at Heritage Railways. So this is really useful. If we're ever in any doubt about whether a task should be safety critical or not, this is a really good place to come. And certainly I know that um, it has been really useful in providing that definition in some Heritage Railways where there's been a doubt as to uh, whether a particular task counts as safety critical or not. OK, so there we go. And you can find that just by typing into Google ORR, safety critical tasks, clarification or any combination of those words. You'll find a website that looks like this. Hopefully you can see that. Let me check that you can. Oh, yep, yeah, you can. ORR, safety critical work. And uh, where is it? This link here, safety critical tasks, clarification of ROGS, regulations and requirements is where I went. Right. OK, so I think we've got through all of the slides. Let's move on a little bit. Right, OK, let's go to Microsoft Word. Excellent. The system works. Right, OK. So here's my template document that I've been writing for you um, based on all the different SMSs that you've sent in and SMSs that I've been involved with over the years. Um, this is what will become available to Advanced Tops members. It's got the same cover pages on that you're, you're used to, just a clarification to anyone that finds it and thinks that it's their own um, organisations, that it isn't, and that they should find their own organisations one and the licence under which you're allowed to uh, use it and maul it about. Nice little cover sheet. Again, you don't have to use any of this, and I'm not by any means saying that this SMS is the one and only way to be compliant with all those things that we just looked at. I'm just saying this is one way to do it. Uh, right, 
Right, um, I've got a couple of other Word documents as well to show you, but uh, we'll start with this, which is my version of C1, SMS C1, the overall competence management system document, which would apply to the whole organisation. Um, now I know, just before I get into reading this, I know, uh, as I've said, that there is a hugely wide range of safety management system maturities out there. I know that some railways are particularly good at one thing or not particularly good at another and some have very strong policies in some places and not others and I'm sure you know this as well. I'm not going to ask you to say whether your policy is, uh, is good or bad but I do recognise uh, and it's been a subject of discussion over the last uh, several weeks is that there are only so big a steps that can be taken from where you are now to where you want to be. So if the perfect scenario is a is a five-star SMS and you're currently only on a one-star SMS, I do recognise that you perhaps can't go from a one-star SMS to a five-star SMS in one go without completely alienating everyone and losing all the, um, the buy-in and the goodwill and the volunteer effort and all that stuff. And I do recognise that that is an important thing to maintain. So although I hope I'm writing you something that's closer to a five-star SMS, um, I completely accept all the feedback that you give me when you say, we could never implement this on our railway because everyone's heads would just explode. And I would say to that, well, take the bits that you can, identify and record in minutes what you feel you are weak on and what you're doing about it and what your plan is. And even if you only implement one of the three things of your plan this month and then another one of the three things of the plan in six months, you've got your plan of where you're going and you've got your plan of how you're going to get to what good looks like. Um, between now and then. So I do understand that you can't always implement um, everything in the first go. Mm -hmm. Right, I've just been told on my auto here that I'm obviously not being controversial enough because the, uh, the comments are all a bit quiet. So uh, those of you who know me will um, know that sometimes I do say controversial things. I'm trying my best not to, so I'm not going to try and say controversial things, but please do challenge me in the comments if you want. Right, okay, so... Um, <laughs> right, okay, well, some people in the comments have commented that, unfortunately, their SMS is currently zero star, and don't feel that you have to do that and embarrass yourself if you don't want to, but do take what you can out of these uh, templates. Right, here we go then. So, as with the other SMS documents, I always like to start ahead of the document by saying what are we actually trying to comply with here and mentioning the relevant legislation, the relevant regulations that we're trying to comply with. Um, and then there can be no doubt that this document is the means by which the company feels it's discharging its responsibility in that respect. So, the company manages the competence of its safety critical staff as required in Part 4 of the ROGS 2006 regulations. I've just realised we've got Part 4 in there twice. Uh, I did do a lot of editing on this today, so that's probably why uh, I've got some little mistakes. Suitable training and qualification of staff is also required to ensure correct discharge of the company's responsibilities to its staff and volunteers under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. All safety critical tasks shall be performed by a person with an appropriate competence to do so, unless under training or supervision, where their work will be supervised and or checked by a competent person. Remember, we saw that in ROGS a second ago, and I always like, if I'm referring to something that's specifically in a document or in a, uh, a regulation, to just refer to it there to make sure that anybody who comes along and looks at this afterwards and goes, where on earth did you get that from, can look and can go, oh yeah, ROGS part 4, section 23, paragraph 1, part A, uh, what's that, 4 and 5. The requirement for competence is based on the task performed, i.e. uncoupling and coupling trains, rather than the role held, i.e. general manager or driver. Staff competence for non-safety critical work, but that which competences are still managed, i.e. booking offices, are managed under the same system. Um, management of uh, management of the same system. Okay, Adrian, yes, thank you very much, pointed out that those IE should be EEGs. Yep, okay, that's fair enough. Now, um, again, I'm not asking anyone to embarrass themselves in the comments, but I have seen railway competence management systems that end there, that say, we will manage competence, but don't actually say how it's going to be done. Um, and I would definitely say that the SMS should detail how you are going to be compliant. It should detail what you're committing to do in order to keep your hands clean. Um, so using weasel words like, oh yes, we will be compliant and everyone will be competent without actually saying how that's going to be achieved um, is, is not really up to scratch, I wouldn't say. 
Now, as I alluded to earlier, uh, management of competence is divided into departments for ease of administration. So here's a list of documents, sorry, a list of departments. In my SMS 1, and remember, my, sorry, my SMS C1, and remember SMS C1 applies to the whole organisation. It's not going to drill down into how many shovels of coal you should put on the fire. This is how competence is managed across the whole organisation. So I'm going to reference all of the little sub-sub documents, excuse me, in a list here. And you can see I've used the same letters, so it's your initials, slash SMS, slash C, slash M for duty officers, S for signal, and G for guards. And there will be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to however many numbers you want uh, for each of these. Um, and if you're sitting there thinking, oh my god, that's quite, um, that's quite detailed, well, I would say it's a level of detail that is necessary in order for you to be able to demonstrate how these competences and how these sorry, how these competencies are going to be managed and how the risks arising from these tasks are going to be properly defined. Um, remember I said the document numbering is totally up to you, it's just what I've come up with, and you don't even have to separate them all out into different documents. If you like, I've certainly seen uh, competence management systems where there's one document and it's 40 or 50 pages long and it's just all the department documents all in one. It's absolutely fine, it makes no difference at all how you arrange the document. The only thing I would say is that does mean if you make a little change, you've got to reissue 50 pages, Whereas if you break it down into smaller documents, it's a bit more bite-sized to reissue um, to reissue those department documents if they're changed as you go along. Right, staff may undertake tasks that belong to more than one department. That's absolutely fine and you know naturally to be expected on a heritage trail. Mm -hmm. Right, this document describes the high-level principles of competence management that will be applied. Each department listed above also has a competence management document that describes how the principles are applied in the specific department's case. Down we go. So, first thing then, roles, and those of you familiar with HOPS will already be familiar with this terminology, but just to confirm, when I use the word role, I'm referring to a job like driver or dispatcher or signalman or whatever it is, not a competence, because in all of uh, the safety critical roles, I would almost guarantee there's going to be more than one competence required, more than one assessment that has to be done um, in order to be competent for that role. Uh, oh, yeah. There we go. Right. So every role within the company that requires the com that requires the competence of those who carry it out to be managed will be identified. And sometimes that is a significant job if you haven't done it already to identify what are the roles that require competence management. And I know it sounds very easy and it's like step one of how to manage competence, but I promise that um, you know, there are some railways out there who haven't yet done that, and, and that is step one. That is what we need to do. We need to identify all the roles that require the management of competence and write them down in a list. Every role so identified will be the responsibility of a department and detailed in the department management, sorry, competence management document. So in my imagination, in my utopia, every role belongs to a department. And that makes it just fit in nicely with the fact that every department has a head of a department, every head of department reports to a manager of the business unit, it just fits in nicely with that hierarchy, other than having roles that sort of float around with nobody uh, in the structure managing them. There may be an incrementing scale of competence levels within a role, such as level one, level two, level three, or cleaner fireman driver, which I'm sure we all recognise is an incrementing level of, uh, incrementing levels of competence in a footplate um, role. There are many ways to arrange it, you can arrange it however you like, but you've got to identify what the roles are and you need to identify whether they are just binary, somebody's either able to do it or not, or whether there are levels of competence within that role. Rungs on a ladder of promotion, I've heard it referred to as before. The competence requirements for each competence level in each role will be identified and staff must hold all the required competencies for their appointment in order to be competent for the role. So this means that for the role of level two dispatcher, we need to identify what competences that a person trying to do that job needs to have. I imagine there'll certainly be some sort of dispatcher assessment, but they'll probably also need PTS, induction, medical, SMS briefing, all of these other things that are, uh, and are naturally required in a, in a comprehensively managed uh, railway. The competence requirements are referred to as competence elements, a bit of hops vocabulary. In some cases, several roles might require overlapping competence elements, i.e. the competence elements of PTS might be required by many operational roles. And that's absolutely fine. Staff are appointed to a role by the head of department and appointment does not confer competence. 
So roles, jobs to be done. Competence elements are what we're going to assess people on. They're either going to be competent in each one or not, and they need all of them in order to be able to do the role or all of the ones that that role requires in order to be able to do the role. Competence elements are the assessments on a person's competence that are made. Each distinct competence on which a person can be assessed is a competence element and there should be little or no overlap or duplication between elements. So again, when I said a minute ago that step one of competence management was identify all the roles that need to be managed, step two of competence management is identify all the assessments that we can possibly do and which ones are required for which roles. And Again, I know that when you've, if you've done it already and if you've got a comprehensive uh, CMS set up, you'll be thinking, oh, that's easy. But do recognise that if you haven't yet got to that stage, it is quite difficult and takes a lot of thinking and head scratching. And sometimes you find all sorts of skeletons in the closet where you go up to the, the head of Steam Loco and you say, what do we actually do before we let somebody drive the 08 or the, the, the 14 or whatever it's going to be? And they say, oh, I just, I just have a look and I, I see if they're OK. And you go, oh, my goodness me, no, 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 this needs to be a proper role with competence elements that uh, are required um, before you can do it. And I, I, I'm sure that nearly all railways have got some sort of skeleton in their closet where... We just haven't quite got to it yet because we're all developing in our maturity um, where there's a job being done and you think, oh my goodness me, no, 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 this is really supposed to be managed in a more comprehensive way uh, than we're managing it at the moment. So for example, in driving roles, the following competence elements may be required. Rules, route knowledge, traction handling, induction, SMS briefing, PTS and medical. So there'll be one role there, driver, but it requires one, two, three, four, five, six, seven competence elements. And you can see that some of those, the top one, two, three, directly relate to the role that's being done in our imagination, the rules and the route knowledge and the traction handling. You might say, oh, yes, they're the things that I need to do to be a steam driver. But there are also other competence elements underneath that don't necessarily directly relate to driving a steam train, but are nonetheless things that we assess people in and that they must have in order to do that driving role. And it's totally up to you to decide, uh, based on risk and based on what you think people need to have in order to mitigate that risk, which elements are going to be required for which roles. Like I said right at the beginning, ROGS is really largely concerned with safety critical uh, competences, but I would recommend for your non-safety critical ones, just manage them in exactly the same way. So people who work in the booking office, for example, non-safety critical, but you'll probably require them to have an induction and an SMS briefing, cash handling regulations, a briefing on what the tickets, you know, where you can get on a return ticket and what time you can come back. I'm sure there's some sort of training, even if it's slightly less formal, um, and some sort of assessment before you let them handle everybody's cash um, that booking clerks go through. And you can just manage it using the same competence management system as we do for the uh, safety critical roles. Every element will be the responsibility of one or more departments to manage. And that might fly in the face slightly of what I've said so far, but in my mind, everything is in a department. There's nothing outside of a department. If it's outside of a department, then it doesn't have a head of department. It's not being managed. It doesn't report to a manager of the business unit. I know that there will always be some little edge cases that you'll find where you go, aha, Danny, but what about this? And I go, oh, OK, yeah, fair enough. If you need to have like an admin department or a manager department or just something that means people report to a head of department and the elements and competencies and roles are managed by a department, then just make a department up and put the person who's responsible for it in charge of it. That would be my advice. I know, um, and again, I use this example quite a lot, and, and um, uh, I use this example quite a lot, and generally, uh, where are the people that I say to agree, that every railway has got someone that just turns up on a Thursday and paints things. And no one knows who they are or what their next of kin are, or God knows how their competence is managed, they just turn up on Thursday and paint things, and they have done so for the last 40 years. Well, you've got to catch up with those people because they're the sorts of people that are working outside departments and who one day will injure themselves, and uh, it will be very difficult for us to defend that we were discharging our duty of care if we don't know who they are and what their next of kin is or that their work that they were doing wasn't being managed in any way. So every element will be the responsibility of one or more departments to manage. In the above example, let me just scroll back up. Hold on, I've got my mouse here. I have a mouse. Uh, in the above example, uh, rules, route and traction will likely be managed by the footplate department. PTS may be managed by several departments and medical may be managed by a different department altogether. There's nothing at all to say that you can't have in this example a PTS assessor in the steam department and another PTS assessor in the guards department and a 
another PTS assessor in the Sigma department, that's no problem. But I would recommend that you make a conscious decision across the piece what the requirements for PTS are. And if you decide that there is one railway level of PTS, then all the assessors need to be assessing to the same standard. And if you get your PTS as a guard and then you want to become a signalman, you have already got your PTS. Whereas if you make a conscious decision that there is different types of PTS, and certainly railways that um, operate on the main line uh, will have this, if you make a conscious decision that there is different types of PTS, then that's fine. Have two elements of PTS, and you can have some assessors that do one, some assessors that do others, some that overlap. It's absolutely fine, but let's make a conscious decision that PTS is X, Y, or Z, and everyone will assess it to the same thing. We, unless we explicitly decide that it's the case, it is very wishy-washy to have guards PTS, signalman's PTS, logo PTS, just because the departments like assessing it in their own way. Uh, a candidate is either competent or not competent in each element. It's black and white. There's no levels within an element. You've either got it or you haven't. Now, if you think to yourself, oh, well, I've got an element. I really need level one, level two, level three. You'll have to make it three separate elements. Well, I say you'll have to, in my mind, you should make it three separate elements in order to maintain this simplicity that a candidate is either competent or not competent. But as I think we said earlier, we'll try not to duplicate one element inside another element. So instead of having an element for level one, an element for level two that includes level one, and an element for level three that includes level two and one, Let's not do that because we're maintaining that level one competent stuff three times and the level two competent stuff twice. Let's have an element for level one that everybody does, an element that only includes the additional stuff that you need for level two, which only the level two and three people do, and an element that only includes the stuff you need for level three, which only the level three people do. So if you're a level three, you'll have to have three elements. If you're a level two, you'll have to have two elements. And if you're a level one, you'd only need one element. And that, to me, is a much, much cleaner way of arranging it, only having everything written down once and not trying to maintain the same thing in three or four different places. The competence elements that are required for each role will be detailed in the Department Competence Management document. Oh, and in fact, the last paragraph is everything I just said. Whoops, is everything I just said about uh, not duplicating um, the contents of one element inside another. For every element, a competence assessment criteria will be drawn up. We'll have a look at one of those in a minute. So, just to recap, roles are the jobs. Driver, fireman, signalman, dispatcher, that sort of stuff. Each role can have increments of competence within it, level one, level two, level three, or cleaner, driver, fireman, or trainee, um, passed out, probationer, fully passed out, advanced passed out, assessor for example. Um, I, do, I do think probationary roles in, in a heritage railway environment are a good idea before you let a driver take foot plate passengers and do driver experience and all that stuff. Maybe best to let them have a bit of a probation period first, particularly because the risk is heightened in a heritage railway because we don't do it every day. It's not our full-time job. We do it less than if it was our full-time job. It takes us a bit more time to get confident and used to what we're doing before we start training other people, before we start having foot plate passengers, before we start doing triple header non-stops and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Nick Wellington in the comments has asked, how come the network rail doesn't go to such extensive lengths? I have no idea. I do not know anything about uh, what network rail does or doesn't do. I certainly wouldn't compare one organisation to another and say just because they don't do it, uh, that means we don't have to. Um, what we're doing here is complying with ROGS, and uh, I can't get away from ROGS, I'm afraid. So yes, I don't know under the bonnet what uh, mainline organisations do, but I would point out, though, that possibly at least part of the reason is mainline risks are very different to heritage railway risks. Some are greater and some are less, of course. There's probably a greater level of exposure and inherent risk in a heritage railway that uses very old technology using volunteers who, with the best will in the world, and I'm sorry if this offends anyone, but with the best will in the world, overall are slightly less emotionally involved in maintaining their position as a volunteer than if it was their uh, employment which was going to pay their mortgage and put food on their table. Sorry if I haven't worded that very well, but I hope my meaning is coming across. 
um, and they don't do it very often. Um, and I'm probably, um, you know, maybe only a Sigma for one weekend a month or something like that compared to a Sigma that does it every single day. That's the only thing I can um, really comment on without knowing in detail what another uh, organization does or why. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, Tom Bailey has made a question about a post-qualified assessor, which I don't quite understand. So, Alex, if you can see if you can get some more detail for me and put that in the machine, uh, I'll be grateful and I'll do my best to answer. But I'm afraid I don't quite understand what's what's popped up there, um, which may well have been transcribed from what Tom actually wrote uh, in my in my auto queue. Right, so where do we get to? So that was roles, competence elements are the things that we assess people in. Everything that we assess somebody in wants to be a competence element. And don't be surprised if you're a medium-sized railway and you end up with 40 or 50 or 60 competence elements, you'll be surprised how quickly it stacks up. But competence, step one, is identify what the roles are that need to be managed. Competence, step two, is identify what the assessments are that we need to give people and what the relationship is between elements and roles. Which roles need which um, elements. Right, okay, I hope that's all clear. Right, on to some more general things then, because um, remember this is the overall document. This document is not going to get into that you have to do three turns as a fireman before you're allowed to be a driver. That's going to be in the department document, which of course we'll look at next. Think about selection next. Anyone wishing to undertake a safety critical operational duties in any grade will discuss their aspirations with the training officer, if you have one, I made that title up, or head of department from the department they wish to join or progress within. And an informal interview will be conducted to assess suitability, including physical ability, for the desired position. This is all very informal. It's somebody going to the inspector or head of department or whatever and saying, do you know what, I'd really like to do that job. Can I have a go? And it's definitely best to have that discussion with a person to establish whether they are suitable for the job and whether that is likely they're going to succeed in it before wasting their or the railway's time. So not that I would um, uh, not that I would recommend being ageist, obviously, but if you have a volunteer who's 90 who's never driven a steam engine before in his life and turns up and says, "Yes, I want to be a steam driver." it might be a good idea to suggest to him at least what the service requirements are as a cleaner and then a fireman before you're allowed to become a driver and whether it's likely he's ever going to get there and whether that affects his um, aspiration to do it or not. Staff are selected for roles based on the following criteria. Suitability criteria such as attitude and reliability and temperament and learning ability and physical abilities. I'll come back to that in a minute before everybody jumps down my throat. Time, commitment, availability, entrance exams, pre-existing experience, cognitive capacity and medical requirements. On capability, consideration is given in selection to the ability of a candidate to perform the tasks that will ultimately be, ultimately be required of them. See the reasonable adjustments section below, which we will definitely talk about shortly. The selection process may be informal or a formal scoring system may be prescribed in the Department of Competence Management documents, and I suspect a lot of that depends on how uh, flush with volunteers you are and whether you uh, allow anyone who wants to to volunteer or whether you have too many people that want to volunteer and not enough work for them to do, in which case you can afford to be a bit more selective perhaps. Subject to satisfactory completion of any documentation and interview, the candidate must be introduced to the department inspector or assessor, again I made those terms up, who will arrange training and assessments as required by the company under this procedure. Right. <laughs> right, thanks very much, Tom, for clarifying your question. So Tom says, you mentioned a probation period for drivers, for example. I know my company give them a post-qualified assessment card to say to anyone else that they are new, they're a new driver, though qualified to drive. Right, got it. So they've sort of got their P plates on, they're not allowed to take foot plate passengers and they get that on a little card. That's a good idea. That's a good idea for making sure they understand what the limitations imposed of them are, but also that they can, if necessary, demonstrate it to somebody else. I'm sorry that I can't do this because here's my card. So yeah, that sounds like a good idea to me. General terms on training. Before training for any role, the candidate will be required to complete the company induction process and be issued with a copy of the documentation that is issued to all staff. 
It is the responsibility of the copyholder to ensure that these documents are kept in good order and up to date with any supplements or amended pages inserted as required. The cooperation of staff in preserving the integrity of these various documents is appreciated. Uh, the trainees will be issued with a logbook. So here we are in SMS C1, we're prescribing that every trainee will be issued with a logbook in which details of training terms and subjects covered must be recorded. Of course, if you decide that across the whole organisation, not every trainee needs a logbook, then you can take that paragraph out and put it into the department documents of the departments that require it. You may find some stuff in the department documents where you think to yourself, that's going to apply to everybody, so we'll move it up to C1, or stuff that's in C1 that you might want to lose, uh, move downwards. Um, right, Richard Lemon has just made a very interesting comment. Thank you very much, Richard. He points out that although ROGS only applies to the running line, it doesn't apply in silence and possessions and things like that, but pure the provision and use of work equipment regulations applies all over the place whenever work equipment is provided and used, and so we can treat it all the same. Um, yes, so another excuse that we can uh, get rid of is that ROGS doesn't apply in sidings, or in possessions and things like that, so this shouldn't have to apply. Well, pure and the Health and Safety Work Act still does apply, so you can go back and say, nice try, but unfortunately you still have to comply. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much for joining you. Um, on completion of the training, the original logbook must be retained in the candidate's file. Trainees may request a personal copy if desired. But any logbooks, notes or training documents issued by the training officers, assessors or inspectors are to assist in the training and may provide an aid memoir once passed out for a particular grade. But these documents do not amend or replace or supersede any rules or regulations or other formal documents which always take precedence. And it is the member of staff's responsibility to maintain and upgrade their knowledge of the task as information is issued and amended after they passed out. It is not appropriate, here we are quashing yet another uh, excuse, it is not appropriate to continue to conduct the task in the same way just, just because that's how I was trained, which is something that gets wheeled out quite often. Remember that in the same way that just because we can't pass a person out and say that's fine for you for two years, we're still required to monitor them and review their competence if it starts to deteriorate. There is an onus on the individual, here in the template document at least, that says just because that's what your training document says, if we then subsequently issue uh, an amendment or a revised instruction, the onus is on you to follow the revised instruction rather than what happened to it in your training document when you initially passed out all those years ago. Right, okay, so that's training. Competence standard. A competence standard details the criteria against which each competence is assessed. This includes all aspects of the task that the assessor requires to be confident of the candidate's ability to perform. All aspects of the task that the assessor requires to be confident of the candidate's ability to perform. It's really important that if we're assessing someone, we're assessing them against something. I would go as far as to say that it is 99% impossible to assess someone if we haven't got something to compare them against that we're assessing them against. But it's really important that the competence standard that we write contains all the things that we later want to be able to say, we trained and assessed this person on that. It's not very good to have a competence assessment criteria that says the person knows how to use the rail saw, because it doesn't actually say what we're um, assessing them on. Now, whether you choose to put every single little detail in the competence assessment sort of sheet that the assessor's going to stand next to the person on a clipboard with, um, and have them tick off, or you put it in a separate competence assessment um, sort of manual document and just the headline in the in the tick sheet, it's up to you, it's fine, but it's got to be written down somewhere that they understand how to inspect the rail saw before use, look for frays in the wire, uh, check that the casing is all intact, check that the disc is uh, properly attached and, and freely go around without wobbling all over the place, that they apply the clip to the rail in the proper way, that they tighten it up, that they offer up the disc to the line that they've drawn on the rail to check that it's in the right place, that they know how to set up the exclusion zone so that no one else gets their head cut off, you know, all those sorts of things. If they're things that you want to be able to demonstrate you are training and assessing people on, then this is the place where they're going to have to be written down. And remember, Rob said it had to be written down. The, therefore, the next conclusion of that is if it wasn't written down, it doesn't count. This is where it needs to be written down. 
The competent standards should be freely available within the department in order that all staff can informally monitor their own competence to the standard or can see in, in advance while they're training um, all the things that they're going to have to do. And I don't feel that that is telling the candidate the answers. That is telling the candidate what they're going to be assessed on. If the assessment criteria lists out all those things that I said about, um, uh, about how to use a rail saw, and obviously I only got five things into the probably 25 or 40 things that um, you'd have to know in order to use a rail saw, um, it would be a good thing for the candidate to understand those and be able to refer to them during the assessment um, in order to know where they are in their own competence. Some things, of course, you can't. Sorry, I should just say I do know that some things you can't, some things you have to keep confidential um, where the assessment criteria is the answer. And in fact, the department one that we're going to look at in a minute, provided that we have time, um, is a duty officer's one. And that essentially does have the answers in it. It's almost like there are no questions. We just expect you to tell us the answers because that's the nature of the body. Um, so in general, I would say the competence standard should be freely available. Uh, but if it can't be, maybe some other substitute indication of what the criteria are, what the competence is that people are expected to maintain so that they know what they have to do um, in order to pass out. Right, assessments. The mechanism by which staff will be assessed for each competence element could be any or a combination of written, practical, observation or evidence-based assessment. So written, they do a test, 15 questions, and they answer them and somebody marks it. Practical is they're asked, can you show me how you would do a such and such? And they do it in front of the assessor and the assessor ticks off all the things that they do. Observation, they're doing their job normally, uh, obviously under supervision if they're still training and being assessed. The assessor just sits quietly in the background and ticks off the things as they do them without asking them specifically to show them what to do. Or evidence-based assessment where you can collect up paperwork or, uh, I can't think of what else, but paperwork, uh, forms that have been filled in, um, documentation, what other evidence could you have? Voice recorder evidence, I suppose, if you have voice recorders. Um, evidence-based assessment like that, but again, in all cases, still needs an assessment criteria um, to work to. David Pope comments that getting everyone to agree on what good looks like is an interesting process. Yep, yeah, absolutely it is, and I don't think we'll ever, ever all agree on that. Um, but it does help if you've got a, um, a strong company structure, like the one that I uh, described at the very beginning. And it doesn't matter what you call the names, but if it's a nice pyramid shape with one person at the top, and that can be delegated down as far as it needs to go, ultimately, somebody somewhere in the company has to be trusted to make the decision of what good looks like. The company backs them up and lives and dies by what that person um, decides. Obviously, following the uh, proper process for getting it approved, um, and the second person being involved, and then it going one level up to be um, approved, for example. But there will always be arguments, I think, and, and let's make the most of those uh, arguments and discussions when people say, I don't think we should have to do this, why don't we do that instead? The assessment criteria says this, but I don't think that's very good. That's really good. That's people engaging with the SMS and engaging with the competence management process. And we, we can harness that and we can, we can say, oh, brilliant, let's have a discussion then and rediscuss what we think the right answer is and if necessary, update the process. Um, I would say that's a really good way to get closer and closer and closer to the sort of impossible, ultimate good, what good looks like in the middle um, and get closer to what everybody thinks uh, it should be. So yeah, definitely really very difficult, but you, let's use it to our advantage in, um, in having that discussion. So where do we get to? Sorry. Oh, one paragraph in. Right. OK. So assessments must be planned in advance at a time and date agreeable to the candidate and the assessor. Candidates should only be assessed following a satisfactory period of training or experience gained elsewhere where there is a reasonable chance of success to avoid unnecessary disappointments. There is certainly no uh, point in assessing somebody if there's not a catch chance in hell they're going to pass out, just wasting everybody's time and uh, diminishing their enthusiasm. Assessments are, wherever possible, conducted by a person who has not directly been involved in the candidate's selection or training, but who has knowledge of their performance during training. So a very, very interesting uh, discussion that was had in the lead up to this with somebody else who's involved in competence management at a, at a very high level, both on a heritage railway and on the main line. And they made a very interesting comment that it's possible to fluke an assessment. And so the assessor really needs to be confident not only that the candidate has performed well on the assessment on the day, but there has at least half an understanding of how they well they've done in their training to get there. And that the assessor's decision is the reason why we have the assessor, 
If they deem the person competent and we can demonstrate it with evidence, they're competent. But no matter how much evidence we've got, if the assessor doesn't believe the person is competent, then they are not competent, because that's why we have assessors. So previously, I might have this paragraph might have said um, that the assessor should be somebody who wasn't previously involved, full stop. And now it's been changed to say, uh, but who has a, a knowledge of their performance during training in order to, to make sure that we are assessing the person on a wider input than just that one assessment, which they could just get right by law, for example. Um, but preferably not the same person who's been that person's trainer for the last six, week and has, six weeks and has done every session of training, because then they're essentially assessing their own work, they're assessing how well they've trained um, a person. I know it's not always possible, and I know that we're, in most cases, limited on volunteers, and you might think, oh, Danny, how many volunteers do you think we've got? We've got people to do all these different things. We have one, and that's it. Well, if you've only got one, you've only got one. You're going to have to make do with one, but where possible, a different person, ideally. Consideration must be given in assessments to the needs of the candidate to ensure they are not restricted in their ability to demonstrate competence by virtue of a disability or a special requirement that is not relevant to the skill being assessed. And again, we will get to this reasonable adjustments uh, in a minute. If the person can do the job but can't do the assessment, we need to try and make reasonable adjustments so that they can do the assessment. That's what it is. Assessments are made against a written competence standard and each component will be graded on a scale of one to four. And I know some people have one to three, some people have one to five, some people have A to E, it's fine, whatever you want. Uh, just some sort of scoring scale is becoming more um, more of an expectation nowadays, I would say, than just yes or no, the person did that or they did it. So here's what I came up with. One, unsatisfactory, it's like a major on your driving test. If you get a one, the assessment outcome is going to be not competent. That's the end of that. Uh, two, competent but required prompting. So not completely terrible and isn't going to get a not competent out of it, but wasn't quite as on the money as we would probably like. This could be an example as if I said to you, um, what would you do if this happened? And you said, I would do this and I would do that and I would do the other. And then I, as the assessor, said, well, what do you think about that? And they go, oh, yes, and I would also do the other thing as well. So I haven't given them the answer, but I've had to prompt them a little bit to make them think of the extra thing that they didn't quite get. And it's up to you as the assessor to decide whether that prompting uh, deserves a two, or and they would probably have got it in the field, or whether they would never have got it in a million years, and it's really important, and so it's going to earn a one um, that is unsatisfactory. Um, a three, which is like the middle, I know it's not the middle, but a three is like the middle, yep, competent, no prompting required, and a four is excellent, candidate really exceeded the performance requirements. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as like a super competent, you're still only competent, um, but it just recognises, which I think is important in an assessment, it recognises that the candidate's put in a lot of effort, has achieved a really, really good standard, and we can reward them by giving them a four on a piece of paper, isn't that marvellous? Right, Adrian has pointed out, with regards to my uh, comments earlier about a different person than the person who did every single training session being the assessor, that if you rotate the mentor, then it's not such an issue. Yep, I completely agree with that. If you've got six mentors and they've all had a go at training this person and then one of them does the assessment, I'd say that's absolutely fine. Uh, the assessor will record some comments for any component of the assessment that scores a one, two or four. So if it scores a three down the middle, then no commenting required. But for each component that scores a one or a two, the assessor needs to write some comments to sort of justify their um, uh, uh, justify why they've given the person a one or a two. Uh, or if the assessor has given the person a four, they need to justify that as well. And although I'm not going to talk today, I'm probably not going to finish everything I was going to say today. We'll, we'll come back another week, but I'm not going to talk in this SMS workshop about quality assurance of the assessments. I'm sure maybe sometime in the future we'll think we'll talk about that on HOPS Workshop 6000. Um, but as a general rule, you can't give everyone a three. You cannot give everyone a three on everything. That's lazy assessing. Nobody will ever believe that everybody is exactly the same level of competence and it's exactly the level of competence that is competent with no prompting required for every component on every assessment they've ever done. The assessor um, needs to do some work and needs to grade some people one, two and four, um, not just for the sake of it, but because it would be unbelievable if everybody was always a three. Uh, there needs to be some ones, twos and fours in there from time to time. 
Um, Adrian says that he got a five because he prompted the assessor. Yep, Adrian, you can have a five, even though the score only goes from one to four. Well done. Uh, right, assessments must be fair and objective. Assessments must be recordable and sufficient to be used as evidence in the future if an assessment decision is tested later. So this comes right back to what we said right at the beginning. To comply with ROGS, it's got to be accurate, up to date and written down. So it's only a value in that written down state if it's sufficient to be used as evidence in the future if your competence decision is tested later. To be blunt, after the incident occurs and the ORR have arrived and asked to look at everybody's competence. So much of um, what we do on railways is based on risk assessment, and this is no different. If we're assessing somebody on how to sweep up leaves in the car park, there are some risks, but the risks are going to be relatively low, and so the chance that we're going to have to defend them is relatively low. Whereas if we're uh, assessing somebody's competence on how to turn on and off the nuclear reactor in our steam engine of the future that's powered by a nuclear reactor, that has quite a lot of risk to go wrong. And so the risk that we're going to have to um, justify our decision making later is proportionally higher. And so the, the, the level of evidence and, and how detailed it is and how many pages it takes up and how many kilograms it weighs on the weighing scales um, uh, will be a lot greater um, in those cases. But there is no official written down, um, you must record this or you must record that. It's, it must be written down and you'll find out whether or not it was right or wrong after the incident when you're asked to demonstrate it. Um, and, and that's the only way, uh, unfortunately, that you can find out whether it was good enough or not. An observation assessment must be fully recorded in writing by the assessor. The assessment record must mirror the competence standard being used. The version number of the competence standard being used must be recorded in the assessment evidence. Again, as I said at the beginning, if it's all on one sheet anyway, then the two sheets can't get lost and there's no confusion over version numbers and things like that. Assessments must make a judgment of the candidate's confidence as well as competence. Assessment outcomes. The assessment outcome is communicated to the candidate as soon as possible. Assessment results can only be binary. The candidate is either competent or not competent. The assessor is responsible for updating the competence record system, which of course is going to be in hops, and filing the evidence or uploads of scans. The assessment must be recorded even if the result is not competent. That's important. If our competence management system only ever contains competent results, that's not going to look like we're assessing people very well. So even if it's a not competent result, still record it in the competence management system. It is beneficial to be able to show that sometimes people don't pass out. The competence management document, the, oh, sorry, the department competence management document details the process following a not competent result, such as whether people have been trained or what it is. Because obviously that will vary from role to role. The candidate must be given feedback by the assessor on any components or part of the assessment that wasn't fully met, who weren't fully met, that weren't fully met, uh, that weren't met, oh my goodness, I'll rework that sentence later, that weren't met fully correctly, so scored a one or a two, and any that were excellent, so scored a four. A competent may, a result may only be recorded when the assessor is satisfied with the candidate's answers and the candidate has satisfactorily absorbed the feedback given regarding the incompletely answered parts. In general, there will not be a pass mark for, for, a, score, my goodness me, for a score obtained in an assessment. The requirement of 100% understanding after feedback applies to all assessments. I think that's probably the most controversial thing I'm going to say today, so please feel free to uh, you know, all jump around in the comments if you want to. I know that we like having assessments that are easy, and we say, oh, the pass mark is 90%, and that's lazy assessing. We're not actually assessing anyone then, are we? We're just following what it says and going, oh, you've got 90%, that means you're competent. That's not assessing somebody. So I always say, there is no pass mark. The, part, the, the, the question paper that you're doing, or the observation reports that uh, I'm writing, or that I'm watching what you're doing, is just evidence that I'm going to use to ultimately make a competence decision. I'm the assessor, I'll make the competence decision, I'll record it in evidence and I'll live and die by that decision and the company will back me up. So I'm quite happy to say that if you score 100% in the test and then in our little conversation afterwards, I don't believe you actually understand what you're talking about, I'll mark you not competent. Or you can only get 50% in the test. And then when we have our little discussion afterwards where I give you the feedback on all the ones and twos that you got, 
And as a result of that, somehow, miraculously, maybe this is a bit of an extreme circumstance, if as a result of that I'm fully satisfied that you actually do understand it all after all, and that you were reading it in French instead of English, or you know, some mad excuse as to why you got all these questions wrong, but as the assessor I do actually believe that you did it right, then I'll take the evidence of the question paper that you did, I'll take the evidence that I've recorded of the discussion, the feedback that we had afterwards, and why I now think that you're competent, and I'll use all that to reach a um, competent um, outcome. So yes, I'm not a big fan of pass marks um, scores. Um, I believe that you've got to understand it to 100% of my satisfaction as the assessor, and then you'll be competent, and if you don't, then you won't. Obviously, if you don't agree with that, you can take those paragraphs out and put in what you uh, think should be the case. Or maybe it might be true in some departments and not others, in which case take it out of C1, put it into the department competence management documents that it um, does apply to. The term fail should not be used, should not be applied to competence assessments unless or until the company determines that the candidate will no longer be able to be reassessed following an unsuccessful result. Just because you didn't get everything right today and I didn't make you competent today, should not automatically mean that you can never ever be competent in this role. Hopefully as a result of the feedback, as a result of the uh, discussing the ones and twos that I gave you, we'll agree some sort of plan as to how you can get better at those particular things, how many more turns you're going to be required to do, which particular documents I think you should read, whether you should go out with a particular another driver who's particularly good at training those things or whatever it's going to be, and then I'll come back and assess you again in three weeks. The term fail is unnecessarily harsh, I think. Uh, and just to show you that we are um, open to being challenged, the candidate may appeal a competence decision if they feel the assessment has been unfairly conducted to the head of department or the manager of the business unit. Note that thus they can appeal the competence decision if they feel the assessment has been unfairly conducted, not if they feel it was fairly conducted and they just disagree with the outcome or they disagree with the criteria against which uh, they were assessed. And I haven't got any further with what to do there. I think that's more of a, um, a personnel matter than a competence matter. Right, reasonable adjustments. Here we go. I've alluded to this uh, a few times. Let's talk about reasonable adjustments. Where a skill is required to undertake a particular task and the candidate struggles with a particular... S with the... With that, oh, sorry, okay, with that particular skill, but could otherwise complete the task adequately, then reasonable adjustments will be made in the selection, training, assessment, and conduct of the task itself where this is possible. It's not always possible, but where it is, we are obliged, in fact, um, to do so. However, due to the nature of railway worker disability may be a barrier to undertaking some roles. For example, if a candidate has difficulty speaking, it is appropriate for them to be allowed to write their answers down, provided that speaking is not a requirement of the skill being assessed. This would be appropriate for a task such as a draftsman of technical drawings, where speaking is not required, but not as a guard, where speaking is necessary to conduct the tasks. So your competence management system for draftsmen of technical drawings might say there will be a verbal assessment and we'll ask you how to do technical drawings, and that's fine. But when you get somebody come along who has difficulty speaking, it would be reasonable to make an adjustment for them that they could write their answers down because speaking is not a necessary part of doing technical drawings. Or speaking may not be a necessary part of doing technical drawings. It depends on the nature of the task and how it's deployed at your uh, railway. However, roles associated with the task of coupling and uncoupling of trains cannot be performed by a person without the physical strength and mobility to do this. This is reasonable and legal, as it is not reasonably practicable to make adjustments to the task to accommodate the person with the physical, uh, without the physical capability. Just to make sure, though, that we're not making the wrong decision, consultation should be made with the manager of the business unit if it is thought that a person may not be fit for the task they are being considered for due to a disability. Just to make sure we are properly considering all the circumstances and whether there are reasonable adjustments that we can make. Roles associated with tasks requiring a person to use a handheld telephone while entering information into a booking system may initially seem problematic for a candidate who only has one arm to perform, to perform, to perform the task with. But it is possible to make a reasonable adjustment by providing a telephone headset so that the candidate can complete the tasks required. And it would almost certainly not be appropriate to refuse the opportunity to a candidate to be trained and assessed for this role. 
Last one, where a role requires a candidate to perform a task that does not require reading or writing, but the assessment for the task is a written assessment, it is easily practicable to provide an alternative method of assessment for the candidate, such as the assessor reads the questions out loud and the candidate answers them verbally. It would almost certainly not be appropriate to refuse the opportunity to the candidates to be trained and assessed for this role. Candidates may have some other requirements, such as the presentation of documentation in different formats or sizes or colour contrasts. And all of those things are things that we should, and if we're honest, we are obliged uh, to be doing um, in order to make sure we're not discriminating against somebody that has a disability. But that's not to say that if you get a person who is bound to a wheelchair and they want to be a guard, that you have to completely redesign the railway so that they can be a guard in their wheelchair. If the task requires them to do something that they can't do and it's not possible to make um, uh, reasonable adjustments, then it is legal to say, I'm very sorry, but you can't do that task. Mm -hmm. Right, Adam from the Dean Forest Railway has commented regarding confidence. Confidence is an interesting one when you have people under practical assessment. Having the assessor at arm's length or sat having a coffee and letting the candidate get on with the job works quite well. Yes, as long as you can demonstrate that that assessor is actually assessing. So what you can't do, which I have seen done before, is you can't assess somebody driving a train from the carriages. You've got to be on the footplate. Um, but yes, I certainly take the point that putting the candidate under pressure in the assessment is, some, is, is often not the best way to get the best performance out of the candidate. Um, and part of the skill of assessing, I would say, is to get out of the candidate what performance they can demonstrate um, and assess the point. I would also say, though, that there will be some people who do not have the confidence to do the role in practice. And using I was stressed and under pressure because of the exam doesn't always work. The assessor's got to be able to work out the difference there between somebody who's under pressure because of the exam somebody who doesn't actually have the confidence to stop a train in an emergency or to um, uh, tell another member of staff that they're behaving unsafely and that the performance uh, that the behavior needs to be changed. Excellent, right, a few last little things then on this. Candidates with previous uh, experience or skills. Candidates with experience from other railways, mainline or heritage or other industries may, at the discretion of the head of the department, be exempted from some or all of the training requirements, but not, except as shown below, from the assessment requirements. So you can, um, so you can reasonably, as long as you can demonstrate that it's not unsafe, um, bypass some of the training, but try and avoid bypassing, if you can, the assessment. All staff working for the company must complete the company's own assessment requirements unless authorised by the manager of the business unit. The manager of the business unit must make a detailed written justification for permitting a deviation to the normal assessment process and record this in hops when granting the person's competence. So if a person arrives at my steam railway who I've never seen before um, and says, um, I'm a current mainline steam driver and I drive exactly the same class of engine that you've got here, please can I come and drive yours? Obviously, I want to say, yes, brilliant, fantastic, another volunteer, and they're fully, um, or they, they are extremely likely uh, to be fully competent to do the job that I need them to do. I'll still have the interview with them. I'll still expect some sort of evidence that what they're saying isn't just completely made up, but I'm not going to make them be a cleaner for a year and then allow them to have a footplate ride. I'm going to expect them to come up with some evidence from their own company, from their mainline company, that they, um, that they do what they say they can do. And then I'm either going to require them to do my own internal assessment, and considering that I can't imagine that's going to be very onerous on traction handling for somebody who has um, done it as frequently as this imaginary person has, um, hopefully that will be the way I do it. Obviously, they'll still have to do their rules assessment because the rules are not necessarily the same. They'll have to do their route knowledge because the route knowledge is definitely not the same. They'll have to do their SMS induction because the SMS is not going to be the same. They'll have to do all that stuff. Um, I, say, I would say that the excuse here of the manager of the business unit authorising somebody not to do the assessment is really for occasions where the circumstances don't fit with the competence management system for whatever reason. And I can't think of an example off the top of my head. It's far easier, far better, far more robust to just get the person to do the test, even though they're going to hopefully get 100% on it, than it is to dream up a reason why they shouldn't have to if the circumstance arises, 
then there's a clause in there for the manager of the business unit to authorise it to go a different way. Um, coming back to talking about monitoring again uh, and assessing, uh, David from the Bureau of Valley Railway, thank you David, has pointed out that discreet monitoring is sometimes necessary if concerns exist. Yep, absolutely right, that's fine. Um, and that I would say just comes as part of normal monitoring, that's, uh, that's absolutely fine. There should be, incidentally, um, following the advice that's given by a regulatory authority to some railways, not all monitoring should be discreet. There should be some obtrusive uh, monitoring. But yes, completely agree with you, David. Completely take your point there. Right. Competences expiring and recertification. In some cases, a competence will be awarded with an expiry date. This is most often the case for safety critical competences. The expiry date is set at the time the competence is awarded, and after that date, the candidate is expired. That's the word that Hobbs uses, so that's the word that I've used here in the template, expires. And expires means um, not competent. Okay, so I've passed you out today, subject to monitoring and the satisfactory performance. You are okay for two years, and hopefully before two years arrive, somebody will come and recertify you for another two years. But if that two years rolls around, <coughs> expired, end of competence, very sorry, but that's just the way it goes. Obviously, hopefully the person will still be recertified and will get another two years, but an expiry date is an expiry date for a reason. The Department of Competence Management document for the element concerned will detail the recertification procedure that candidates must undertake in order to extend their competence. Um, Paul Richardson asks, some competencies should be accepted, such as PTS. Would I agree? No. <laughs> I will give more of an answer than that. I don't think you should take any competence that's awarded by another company at face value. Because if you do, you, you still need to be able to demonstrate how that person, um, how you know that that person is competent. Now, you might be able to get a copy of the, to use PTS as an example, you'd get, you might be able to get a copy of the PTS assessment criteria that whatever company gave that person mainline PTS was using, compare it to the risks on your particular railway or the competence assessment criteria that you use and go, yes, what they've assessed equals or betters what we've got. So I'm going to use that as the evidence. Um, I'll go to the manager of the business unit because that's what it says in here and say, I want this person to not have to do the assessment. Is that acceptable? The manager of the business unit will either agree or not agree. The whole lot gets recorded in hops and we're safe because we can record, sorry, we can demonstrate in writing how we arrived at that competence decision. It is our competence decision to make. No one else can make that competence decision for us. And if we blindly accept another company's competence decisions, then we are we are heading for a, a you know a difficult uh, situation. Uh, apart from uh, haha, apart from Nick has just very uh, cleverly uh, thought of the uh, an example where that doesn't apply. So sorry, I'm just slightly too soon. Um, things like the IRSC licensing scheme, designed to be portable across companies. Yeah, that is the sort of thing where I would say, you still need to look into what the IRSC are qualifying people to do. I could turn up with my IRSC license in a railway and you could let me go and maintain all the signalling, only to find out two years later that my IRSC license is certain licenses to do with certain types of signalling and I've never actually seen a token machine before in my life. And that's why we're now taking 10 tokens out of the machine all in one go. So you still need to accept that the competence decision is owned by the company. Um, and you can use evidence that you've gained from elsewhere, like another company's PTS or IRC scheme, um, but you still need to look into it and check that what that external agency has assessed and granted their version of competence is appropriate for the risks that you want to have railway. Ruth asks, what I've lost experience as an air traffic controller is suitable experience to start a role as a signaller. Um, well, I think I might identify certain things that a signaller needs to do that an air traffic controller does. Certainly accurate verbal communications, working under pressure, working as part of a team, um, controlling movement of equipment, all those things. I might say, okay, Mr. New Volunteer who wants to be a signaller, you, uh, as long as you can demonstrate it by the assessment, you don't have to sit through the whole weekend training course on how to communicate effectively and work together as a team that we normally ask signalers to do, for example. But I would still definitely expect them to go and have to do all the time in the box, pulling the levers, learning block regulations, learning bell codes, all that sort of stuff, because none of that overlaps with an air traffic controller at all. 
Of course, there's going to be a million different permutations of cases as to what experience people turn up with. And we really want to make the best of that experience. We really want them to come and work for us. But on the other hand, remember, we still need to be able to demonstrate how we reach that competence decision after the incident has occurred. And even the best run railways in the world have incidents. Let's not pretend that we're never going to have an incident. So this is all about collecting enough evidence that afterwards we can demonstrate it. So yes, air traffic controller, I would identify which parts overlap with the signaller and say that they don't have to be trained on those parts as long as they can do the assessment, but they still have to do all the other stuff. Um, Phil McIver says that obviously the NRPTS is a higher level than the internal one. Well, you say obviously, but we don't know that for sure, do we? I don't know. You can imagine, in fact, I know for a fact that there are risks on a heritage railway that do not exist on the main line. And so the chances are Network Rail PTS will not cover those. I'm not by any means saying definitely Network Rail PTS is inadequate, but I am saying you can't accept anything at face value because you're making the competence decision. You have to be satisfied that the evidence that you've got and the evidence that you can write down will stand up later if, for example, that person doesn't see a train coming and nearly or actually gets thrown over by the train. Uh, uh, from Middleton, I think, I'm very sorry if I've got that wrong, Middleton Railway, it says, I guess if someone came in with a proper qualification, such as a degree or agency in engineering, they might not need to be in the house, the metal work, machine exams, so we'd be given the confidence with the different evidence, as long as you have those items are covered. Yes, exactly, that's exactly what I mean. The key thing is, as long as you're happy, those items are covered, definitely. Right, I know I said I'd finish at half past eight. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit longer because I want to get to a decent stage to finish this uh, meeting. Uh -huh. um, I want to get to a decent stage to um, uh, to finish, so I will very soon. So we just talked about expiring the drop dead date, maybe two years or three years normally on a heritage railway for safety critical roles. Um, after which the person is no longer competent. It can be, never, but I wouldn't imagine that's appropriate for safety critical roles unless the recertification is covered by another element somewhere else. So in that level one, level two, level three example that I gave, if you assess everyone on level one every year and the level two and level three stuff is not as safety critical as what's in level one, then maybe there doesn't need to be an expiry date on level two and level three. I, I, I can't generalize that uh, it's going to have to be something that um, you judge on a case-by-case -case basis uh, for the roles and the competencies that you're managing and the risks that you've got. Right, skills fade, which hop schools lapsing um, and refreshing of skills. So to address skills fade, staff must conduct a minimum frequency of turns in accordance with the individual department's competence management document in order to maintain their competence. And I've said all, obviously, if you don't want it, you can make it 100 years or something like that. I would definitely say for safety critical roles, it needs to be six months, eight months, 10 months, 12 months, something of that order, um, not 25 years. If a member of staff does not maintain the required frequency of turns, their skills may have faded beyond the point at which the company is prepared to bear the risk and they will be deemed to have lapsed. For clarity, lapsed, uh, a lapsed member of staff is considered not competent for the role and a refresh will be arranged. Uh, the nature of the refresh will be detailed in the department competence management document and different requirements may be applied depending on how long the person has been lapsed for. So quite often I see you must do at least one turn every six months. If you go up to eight months, you just have to do half a day with another qualified person. If you go more than eight months, you have to do half a day with an assessor. And if you go more than 12 months, you have to do the entire assessment again from scratch or something like that. Oh, competence from external agencies. I don't need to read this again because that's what I've just uh, we just talked about with regards to all those network rail PTSs and things. Um, forklift is a good one. Chainsaw. These are generally things that are assessed externally. Um, but I maintain my point, and I know sometimes it's not a popular one. You can't accept another company's competence at face value. You have to be sure that what's been trained and what's been assessed matches your own risks. And in most cases, the forklift and chainsaw companies, training companies, provide you with that information. They provide you with the assessment that the person did. They provide you with what the assessor wrote or the tick boxes that they ticked. And in that case, you can look at it and go, yep, that either matches our risk or it matches our assessment criteria. Off we go, brilliant. But please, please, just because somebody turns up and says, I've got a chainsaw certificate, 
please look into it a little bit to make sure that the chainsaw certificate that they've got wasn't issued by the Danny Scroggins dodgy training company and that it was issued by somebody reputable to a decent set of assessment criteria. So I'm not going to read that again. Monitoring. All holders of competence are monitored by their immediate supervisors in their day-to-day -day work. Oh, this is because I copied this out of a duty officer. Uh, right, sorry, I've completely let myself down there. Uh, there must also be some deliberate or obtrusive monitoring, and the requirement for this is detailed in the department competence management document for each role in the department. So in steam locomotives, quite often that's the ride out, it's sometimes called uh, the box visit to signal and that sort of thing. Monitoring visits are recorded, and of course I hope, in the hops visits to personnel section. Remember, ROGS required us to do monitoring, it required us, there's no excuse, we have to be monitoring there's no way to get away from it. If a person's competence, oh sorry, a person may need to have their competence temporarily withdrawn or reviewed or reassessed if, again, this is almost straight out of ROGS, the candidate is involved in an operational incident, the candidate has produced work of unsatisfactory quality, where there has been a significant period of absence, e.g. due to sickness, e.g. Adrian, uh, performance or attitude has deteriorated, or the onset of a medical condition implies, oh, sorry, Im, oh, sorry, that impacts on the ability to carry out work satisfactorily. Uh, any such review or reassessment must take into consideration the specific risks associated with the tasks and how they are impacted by the cause of the review or reassessment. So again, very much going to be a case-by-case -case basis, but remember it's in ROGS. We're obliged to do this. We can't hide behind the fact that six months ago they were assessed and they were fine. The fact that we now know they're not means we must review uh, their competence. Right, that's where we're going to end it for today. We will, before the next workshop in six weeks' time, schedule a part two of the HOPS Competence SMS uh, workshop. Obviously, I'll let you know when that's going to be. I'll just briefly show you what that's going to contain. Here's a template in C1 of what the Department Competence Management System should look like. So that is what you'll copy and then tear about for each individual department. Uh, there's a little bit about process review. And then if I can work out, we will, yes, we will look at a department competence management system. This is the one where I just got that paragraph from, the duty officers one, an actual uh, one, selection, roles, grades, training, what elements are required for which uh, competence levels, how assessments are conducted. It's all subject to C1 that we've just read, but this is how it's exactly going to be deployed um, in the department. Uh, how it expires, how it lapses, what monitoring takes place, where we get trainers and assessors from, and where there's progression. Not a lot in the duty officers department. So we'll look at that in more detail next time. And we will also look in more detail next time. Oh, this new um, broadcasting software is so much easier than the old stuff. We will look at a assessment criteria. So this is one I've chopped it off after three questions because I didn't want to see thousands and thousands of things. Um, that the assessor has on their clipboard, rates people one to four, does the comments. These are all the things. You can put whatever extra columns in that you like based on the assessment that you're doing. So in this particular case, the important thing was not necessarily the actions that you take, but why you were taking those actions. That's really what the assessment was. It's, there are many ways to deal with this particular scenario based question, but we want to know why you've decided to choose the things that you've chosen. Assessors follow up points. There'll be much more to it. I'll say I've chopped it off after three lines. Uh, oh, in fact, there's a question two. And then at the end, a competent or not competent feedback signature, blah, -de blah, -de blah. One of those required for every single competence element, because if you don't have something to assess against, then you can't do an assessment. This is a practical one. What the duty officer does when they start the day, during the day. And again, I chopped it off after two, but we had incoming faults, major incidents, member of the public gets injured, you know, all the other things that um, we might want to assess a duty officer on. Same format, one to four, and comments, uh, and then whether they're competent or not competent. So that's what we will look at next time. I'm sorry that I didn't fit it all in. I thought I probably wouldn't, um, but I don't want to just keep on going and going and going forever. Um, otherwise, uh, everybody's head will explode. And as you know, I could talk about hops until midnight if you really wanted me to. So thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. I really hope that's been useful. 
don't feel that just because the workshop has ended that the workshop has ended. You are still very welcome to email me in your comments. If you think that some of the things that I've said are wrong, then you should please do write in and tell me because then everyone else can benefit from your knowledge of me updating the template based on uh, your feedback. Um, the templates will be uploaded to HOPS at some point when the feedback sort of dries up, available to advanced HOPS members. As I said at the start, I'm very sorry, everyone's welcome to join into the workshop, but the templates are only available to advanced HOPS members because we have to pay the bills somehow. But if anybody wants to become an advanced HOPS member, you only have to send me an email. There's a nice little trial period. We can talk about how that uh, moves forward. So in fact, the next SMS workshop, there will be one on the 6th of July, but it won't be the next one because there'll be a competence part two one at some point before that. And let's see what's going to get discussed on the 6th of July. Management of loan working risk. OK, well, we'll have fun talking about management of loan working risk. But at some point between now and the 6th of July, I'll program a part two of the uh, competence um, uh, SMS workshop and we'll talk about the department stuff and the competence assessment criteria. This is your last opportunity, your last 10 seconds now to write any comments or queries in the comments that you want to. I can see there's been quite a few comments, so thank you very much everyone for those. I'm sorry if I haven't answered them all. And just to confirm, like I said right at the start, I'm not saying that I know everything there is to know about competence management and I'm not saying that what we've published here in the template is what you must do or is the only way to do it. And I'm sure, particularly on the controversial subject of accepting external qualifications, um, that there will be things that you disagree with. And that's absolutely fine because it's your undertaking. You're responsible for it. Um, but as I say, if you can share them with me, the things that you disagree with, that will actually really help. And I will um, do my best to include them in the template so that everyone else can benefit. That's it for now then. Thank you very much to everyone for tuning in. I'll see you all again soon. Uh, thank you very much to you, Alistair, for saying that advanced hops is worth every penny. Thank you very much, Alistair, and I'll see you all again soon. Good night!